business, international, and politics. Uh, and so uh, we, uh, we will finish today uh, with uh, Howard Bamsey, a professor here at ANU, uh, Alex Gosman of the AIGN, Peter Castellas of the Carbon Market Institute, and uh, first up, uh, Professor John Hewson, uh, who uh, most of you would know as a former leader of the Liberal Party, but he has not ha only had distinguished top-level careers in politics, but also in academia, business, and the public sector. Uh, he's currently professor and chair of the Tax and Transfer Policy Institute at the Crawford School uh, here at ANU, uh, and uh, one of his many hats is also as chairman of the Asset Owners Disclosure Project. John. Well, thank you very much, Frank. I just noticed what topic I've been given. Looks a bit different to the original correspondence, but I'm to talk about the politics of uh, emissions targets. Um, I could be very brief or I could be very detailed, I guess, on that. I go back um, on this issue to the late 80s, early 90s, um, when um, people were not really paying attention to my environment policy in the 1993 election. They were somewhat distracted by some lies being told about the GST and other things. And uh, I guess it got lost in the thousands of pages of policy detail which people now would describe as the longest political suicide note in history. Having said that, the environment policy actually called for a reduction in emissions by 20% by, by the year 2000 off a 1990 base. So my benchmark in looking at where we are today is that we've slipped a long way uh, and there's been an lot, awful lot of politics played in the last 20 years on this issue to leave us now, I think, internationally as a laggard in terms of the response to climate change, which I find particularly disappointing. I uh, think in particular of a speech that John Howard gave to the um, Nigel Lawson Climate Deniers Group at the end of 2013 in London. I don't know whether you know Nigel Lawson, he was ex-Chancellor of the Exchequer in the UK. I've actually debated him <coughs> excuse me, on climate change. But Howard openly admitted in that speech that he had deliberately played politics on the issue. Sometimes he'd supported a substantive response to climate change, sometimes he'd opposed it. Sometimes he'd have supported an emissions trading scheme, sometimes he'd opposed it. Uh, he played the short-term politics. When it was politically favourable to do so, he supported it. When it was not favourable to do so, he opposed it. And he concluded by saying <coughs> that today he is a um, agnostic, <coughs> excuse me, when it comes to climate change, an agnostic who prefers to rely on his instincts in responding to the challenge. Now, when 97% of climate scientists, uh, peer assessed climate scientists, actually think it's a problem, a serious problem, an urgent problem, and none of us really know much about science except that that's very unusual. Scientists don't usually agree on anything, and here they are agreeing. They normally contest each other's theories and hypotheses, research conclusions. Here they are agreeing. So I would think that it's a question of science, not religion. And secondly, it's not a question of instinct, <laughs> it's a question of scientific fact. And, um, I was very disheartened to hear that sort of statement by an ex-leader of, of my own party. But it's been reflected, I guess, in, uh, in some of the debate since then, as uh, his protege is now Prime Minister. Uh, my ex-press secretary is now Prime Minister. I got great heart in 2007 when uh, Rudd came in. And, um, you know, he had a fairly clear commitment to do something substantive at a time where the electoral support, as polled, was... 80 plus percent, I guess, in favour of doing something substantive in response to climate change. He contributed to building that constituency, I would think, in terms of some of the things he said and did. He uh, promised to ratify Kyoto, something that Howard would never do, and then to move to a very distinct timetable of the Garno report, a white paper, uh, the legislation, and if he couldn't get the legislation through the parliament, he'd call a double dissolution election and, and drive, drive it through. Um, this gave me great heart, and he actually stuck to that timetable pretty well. He ratified Kyoto pretty much straight away. Uh, the Ghana report arrived on time, as did the white paper and the legislation. And then he got sadly lost in... I guess he was surprised, caught short by the fact that Greens didn't support it. It wasn't an, a perfect emissions trading scheme, but uh, I think, given the history, uh, that would have been better than what we've ended up with. Um, but they got lost in the, you know, the negotiation process with the uh, then opposition and so on. When the crunch came, the last hurdle in March of, sorry, February of 2010, to actually call a double dissolution, he didn't, and he got beaten up at uh, Copenhagen and uh, 
that was a factor, in, of course, in leading to his uh, loss of the leadership. I personally believe, and I argued at the time, that if he'd gone to a double do solution, he would have won, and for better or for worse, he probably would still be Prime Minister. So um, I think the politics of this over this period has been very disheartening, and now we have a government that thinks it won the last election because it opposed uh, carbon price, whereas I think it won the last election because they just wanted to get rid of the other side. Um, and um, we've now taken a giant step backwards, not only in terms of the abolition of the carbon price, but the architecture around that and attempts to get rid of Anthea and a whole host of other people who have been, uh, got some very constructive roles to play. And we now have the debate about the renewables energy target, which, you know, to me was an absolute pre-election commitment to leave the renewable energy target for 2020 at 41,000 gigawatt hours, and here we are uh, faced with the possibility that they're trying to negotiate that number down to something called a real 20%. Uh, you know, I, I'm very disappointed with this whole process. Uh, another broken promise, uh, another disastrous step backwards. Uh, at a time when we've had about $20 billion of investment in the wind industry, we've got now about 1.4 billion households with solar panels on their roof. I mean, it is working in the right direction. Uh, it doesn't have the negative effects on electricity prices that they've suspected that it would have as released by the Warburton report, but, uh, you know, we are still in this very much difficult set of circumstances where we've drifted badly to, as I said before, the position of a laggard. My uh, great comfort, though, is <coughs> that the world is leaving us behind. We've been saying for a couple of years, in fact, we've been saying for a couple of years, in fact, that the Chinese and the Americans would do what nobody else expected them to do, and that's actually agree on something in this, in this area, <coughs> and drive the process to towards an emissions reduction agreement by the end of this year in the Paris process. And I've got great heart that that is happening and happening quite decisively. And I think you will find that the Chinese and the Americans will probably do more than they've already said they'll do as they announced at the recent uh, Beijing APEC conference. Uh, I don't know whether you've seen that movie or that uh, video under the dome, which is focusing on the extent of air pollution in China and the uh, the very significant issue that that, that is, uh, the commitment made by the Chinese government to do something about it, uh, very late, of course, into the day in doing that, but, um, you know, that, that uh, video got about 250 million hits in the first few days. It's had a very, very significant impact in China, even though it's recently been, been banned. So I expect that they will continue to drive the process, and we're seeing other countries come on board. Uh, we saw the uh, unusual bipartisan agreement in the UK between... Uh, uh, Cameron Clegg and Miliband to uh, ban uh, the use of raw unabated coal in uh, power generation going forward. We've seen the emissions reduction targets announced by the Europeans, 40%, um, and a commitment by them to lead the world in the area of renewables. I mean, this is gaining momentum. The pressure is on us to actually do something substantive about it in response. Um, go back to my experience with Tony as a press secretary. I have, I won't talk about all that, but I, the, the one thing I can say is that I believe he's quite capable of getting up one day and saying, well, as I said, if the world actually moves, we'd go with them and we'll find ourselves going with them. Thank you. <laughs>